Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, your guide to navigating the decentralized web. I'm your host, Aaron Stanley, and today I'm talking to Garrett Kinsman, who is the co-founder of Nodal. We talk about the challenges of verifying content in a world where generative AI is ubiquitous, and how Nodal is using Web3 technologies like blockchains and IPFS to create solutions to this problem. Garrett, it's really great to have you on the show. Hey, uh, good morning. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. So, Garrett, I think the last time we recorded a podcast together, we were hanging out on the pier in Rio de Janeiro a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I guess we're overdue for a redux, but uh, it's really awesome to see you again here. Um, but why don't you just give yourself maybe a bit of a introduction and to yourself and then what you've been building with Nodal. Sure. So my name is Garrett. I'm the co-founder of Nodal. Um, and uh, I've been working with my co-founders um, for almost a decade now, with, at least with uh, Misha's case, um, always in the space of decentralized infrastructure um, and building things that basically give your smartphone superpowers. Um, so my focus uh, at Nodal has been hardware and now doing partnerships. So finding out how we can bring this out in the real world and, and, uh, and create real business uh, with what we're doing. But I've always been interested in hardware and in, in building things. Um, what we're doing at Nodal, in short, is we're building a digital trust network uh, for the next billion people. Uh, everyone's got a smartphone. We have generative AI coming out and making it impossible to tell what's real. Very soon, everyone's going to have augmented reality. So it's becoming really, really important to know what's real and what's fake, uh, even more so now that we're moving into one of the biggest elections in, in the past few decades. So it's, uh, it's an exciting time. There's a lot of work. And we think that Web3 has some of the best potential to really help uh, people understand what's real and what's fake. And then why don't you give us maybe maybe kind of the the crash course on what Nodal is and uh, sure. and, and how the this sort of smartphone smartphone powered network works, and then um, maybe kind of maybe give a bit of broader context about how this fits into the whole like D pin movement that yeah. seems to be the the narrative du jour uh, of, of right now. Right. So uh, we actually started working together a decade ago on a project called Fire Chat. So I had basically dropped out of college, started working with Misha, uh, my co-founder now, as an intern at his startup, uh, which was actually running in this old World War II office space on Treasure Island, uh, surrounded on three sides by nuclear waste uh, storage. So they basically used to spray ships down with uh, radioactive materials, and they would send dudes in hazmat suits in to, um, to practice cleaning them. And it's where they scrapped all the ships after the atomic bomb tests. So oh, wow. we had this office, I think I was 17, and it was totally normal to just walk out and see a dude in full hazmat with a, uh, a radiation detector walking by. And I just remember thinking, wow, San Francisco is kind of a crazy place. Um, did, your, did your parents know that you were uh, interning in like a nuclear waste dump? They, they, they did. I actually <laughs> I borrowed, I, I borrowed a... Um, a really sensitive Geiger counter, um, and we we ran around doing doing detections and and ca causing trouble. So it was kind of a fun place, <laughs> really a fun place to get your first like real world work experience. Um, yeah, I will say. I mean, that my my first my first job was washing dishes in a restaurant. So <laughs> you're, I think you uh, you went up to me. Actually, I was a paper boy before that. I was a paper delivery yeah. boy. So I just you, remember you won, you, I think you beat me. You got me beat here. Yeah, we'd sit down and, and it was right next to a sewage treatment facility and there would be the guys teaching the grilling barbecue school, which I don't think is there anymore, in the, the kombucha factory. And so we would sit there drinking kombucha, looking out at the radiation signs and the seagulls and people doing kite surfing. Um, but anyway, so we got this, this crazy experience doing fire chat, which the whole idea was to use smartphones to build a wireless network, create a physical mesh network using Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and what other features you have on your phone. Um, and this was back in the day before crypto was a, really a thing. You had the mesh guys, which we were, and a lot of these guys were just building you know, mesh networks on rooftops. We were doing it with phones. Uh, you had the anarchists, um, which were like the torrent guys. Um, 
the which was kind of this extreme, you know, dudes in leather jackets and people hacking things. Um, and then you had the Bitcoiners. Uh, that was it. That was like really the, the the whole crypto space. And it was really exciting to see this develop and actually turn into something where deep in, you know, decentralized physical infrastructure network starts to be something, uh, a thing. So that's, that's been kind of exciting. So it really started out us building smartphone wireless networks. Uh, I ended up spending a few years in India um, in between, came back to San Francisco and we said, hey, let's let's kind of give this another crack, but from a totally different perspective. Uh, using smartphones instead of connecting to other phones, we can use this to connect to devices around us. And we realized that this could be a new type of network that could be used to provide basic wireless services. And that's how the nodal network really started. It was a global uh, decentralized physical infrastructure network to connect things uh, to the internet. Uh, so, uh, so that's how Nodal got its got its start, and we ended up building one of the biggest um, uh, networks for connecting things. And we, we think we inspired a little bit what um, Apple's doing with AirTag and Samsung and Amazon with their own networks. Um, but we realized ultimately um, through starting to work with customers like insurance companies that the value is in verifying reality. The value is mm-hmm. understanding that hey, I have a shipment at this specific spot. Um, I want to know that it's there. I want to know the data that's coming off it as being real. And that's when we started to build out this new product called Content Sign, um, which we're really expanding now. And we just made a big announcement at ETH Denver uh, around uh, around kind of what's coming next and how we can so, use this network in different ways. So really exciting stuff. So, so let's, I want to dive into that. But maybe before we do, I, I'd love to just kind of chat through um, a bit more of like the mechanics of, of the nodal network and, and this network of, of, of smartphone connectivity you've built. And, and, you know, I think one of the really interesting things about, about D-PIN, uh, if we're calling it that, uh, which everybody else is, so we can use that word as well. But like, yeah. the, I guess the idea is that you, you know, you ha- you're basically taking what has existed in sort of centralized, uh, you know, some sort of infrastructure of this exists yeah. in a centralized format. And we're going to basically take that and, and try to recreate that same service, but just outside of a silo, right? And we're going to use uh, tokens and, and basically token economics and incentives to get all of these sort of disparate actors aligned um, to uh, achieve the outcome that we're looking for. Uh, but everybody, every, all the participants in the network are basically acting in their own self-interest by kind of participating yeah. and, and following the, and like following the rules and not cheating. And when everybody plays, you know, the game it, uh, to their own self-interest, like everybody benefits and the network grows and there's more services available to everybody. So, and this is kind of, this is kind of what I find most interesting about crypto just in general is like this whole concept of it's a new way of kind of organizing human behavior in society. But like, yeah. we'd love to just get your, like, like how did you guys kind of design the incentive system behind Nodal? Like how, are, how are people incentivized to actually, um, a, you know, provide, you have to, you have to have a two sided marketplace, right. Of service providers and then the yeah. actual users, but like kind of talk a bit about how does that, uh, how have you guys? How, how have you kind of gone about creating that uh, that marketplace effectively? And it's and it's really tough, um, and it's something that that crypto as a whole really enabled. Um, before you know, when we were working on FireChat, there there wasn't a sufficient way to pay somebody for a packet of data, and now we we start to get to a place where you can pay people almost in real time for contributing to a network, and you can pay them in, in fractions of a cent. Um, so crypto enables that and also enables you to not rely on a single party. Uh, you can decentralize and distribute this, this network around the world and, and, and keep it from being, uh, being shut down in many cases. Uh, so we, we started really with an incentive structure, uh, to build out this, this massive network. And at the beginning, uh, the, the, the currency is worth almost nothing. Uh, and we can use that to kind of create this first spark. Because uh, we looked at doing this uh, in a classical way, actually paying app developers to run an SDK, which would create a network. And some people would come back to us with contracts for millions of dollars a year. Um, so it would be, it's, it's impossible to really, for a startup to go and, and do these types of uh, these things. Uh, but when everyone can participate, everyone can earn a little bit of this network, uh, a lot of really exciting things become possible. 
Um, and so that's really how Nodal started. We started with this, this, uh, this kind of test net. Actually, it was on Stellar. We ended up taking down the Stellar network because uh, we were doing too many <laughs> transactions. Uh, and they asked us politely to, uh, to leave. Um, <laughs> they, they fired we you. Huh? The guys at Stellar, but it's, <laughs> it's, uh, we, we did, we, we, we pressure tested their network pretty well. Um, and, uh, and that network started to, to work. We started to be able to actually detect all kinds of interesting Bluetooth devices with this network. And we were able to use this network to then, um, start, uh, having customers track assets. Got it, got it, and then and then so now you're on on a polka dot parachain, right? Yes. So today, Maybe. today we're on a polka dot parachain. Um, we were one of the early projects to actually build something out on Substrate. Uh, so that was a kind of an exciting experience. And polka dots are really powerful technology. It's 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 really good at what it does. Um, we just think that for a digital trust network. Um, it's really cool if we can plug that into Ethereum. We think that the level of people um, for enterprise and community that we can reach can be expanded even more if we uh, if we start to deploy things on an L1, uh, and that's what we just announced at at uh, at ETH Denver was this idea that we can use a, a layer one as a digital trust network for certifying that things are real, certifying that content, media, and data is real. Uh, and, uh, this we think is going to be a really exciting space as, uh, as, as kind of the race for AI heats up. Yeah. I mean, anybody who's been paying attention the last year can obviously see why a service like this would be valuable, right. Or what the value proposition of this would be and why this might be useful. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, so I, I guess, you know, I'm not going to ask you about like how you stumbled upon the idea of doing this because it, in, I guess in hindsight, it's kind of obvious why this is necessary, but like, I would love to, let's, let's kind of dive into like the mechanics of, of how this actually works. Like how, how does yep. this kind of verification system actually work? Like how can, um, you know, how can somebody actually use this to see if, oh, is this, this image that I see on my Twitter feed, uh, like, is this a real video? Is this a real picture? Mm -hmm. Or is this just some sort of, you know, AI generated thing that's designed to manipulate my emotions and get me, you know, mad at the, <laughs> you know, the, uh, like the, you know, it's like, get me into, whip me up into like my five minutes of hate kind of thing or whatever, or, or yeah. two minutes of hate, whatever the Orwellian phrase is. Right? So you can buy something. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's a great saying. It's like the, the smartest minds of our generation are being used to make people click ads. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is totally true. I would not um, dispute that. Yeah. So what, where content sign came from was this need to certify content and media and data coming from an IOT device. Um, we, I don't know how much I can say, but we actually had signed a partnership with one of the largest, uh, uh hardware security wallet manufacturers out there, um, who had their own IOT division. And we were going to power, the uh, decentralized PKI for this hardware security uh, wallet manufacturer. And um, we ended up building out this incredible architecture that could essentially scale roots of trust better than a centralized certificate authority. Um, now, if you don't know what all this stuff is, it's really boring and hard to explain. Uh, but um, we got very close to, uh, to finishing a deal with them and they just killed the whole division just to focus on consumer uh, hardware wallets. Uh, so we started thinking about this idea that, wow, we can use Web3 as a way to uh, decentralize trust and to actually make an infrastructure that's more efficient than your classical certificate authority. And we sat on this idea for a long time. Um, when we were scaling Nodal, we realized that um, this starts to become a need again from IoT manufacturers. And that we can deploy this to every single smartphone so that anybody can take a certified image, take a certified video or sign documents, and that this could be a really interesting industry. Um, a, a, lot of, a lot of blockchain applications are kind of a, a solution in search of a problem. Um, and we, we've even been guilty of this in the past. Uh, but this is one of the first use cases that's actually really compelling it actually works better than trying to do it with a centralized certificate authority. It's faster, it's, it's more available, it's more secure. 
And so in short, what we are doing is we're enabling anybody with a smartphone to go out and take verified images and videos um, or to, to generate a verified document that anybody can look up using a blockchain. Uh, and uh, this is, starts to become a big industry as AI kind of goes haywire. Everybody saw a few weeks ago the uh, the OpenAI Sora release creating videos that you just were incredible. They looked like you had a professional film crew there, 100% generated by AI. And enterprises are starting to realize this. And if you don't know what data is being ingested into your business and you're making actionable in, uh, actionable uh, decisions based on this, that can have a huge impact. So a lot of enterprises are starting to be really worried uh, about AI, and they want a way to to verify what's happening. Uh, on top of all this, there is a new technology called C2PA, which is created by Adobe. And this is rolling out to pretty much every smartphone in the next year or so. Um, they've already signed deals with Canon, uh, Sony is on board, Nikon, Leica, and along with the media companies like the New York Times and Reuters that will use this standard of image attestation. So you take a picture, you sign it, you can verify uh, when you're reading the New York Times that it's real and it was created by the specific journalist. Um, so this is here, it's, it's, it's coming. Today, this technology is using a centralized route of trust, a certificate authority, and we're one of the first people to push this into a decentralized uh, uh, system. We've actually joined mm -hmm. the working group so that when you take a picture on a Leica or a, a Sony camera someday, it could use our decentralized route of trust um, to push that image and verify that that image um, was taken using a blockchain. And then, so maybe give an example of, of how, like, how would I, as just like a random person, uh, who is taking images and like posting things on social media or whatever, like how would this like work? Would I, would I have to just download like your, your app or I have to be like running, you know, I'd be like part of like the nodal so, operating system or like how, or how would it, like how would this work if, if, if I'm just a random, random consumer who wants to utilize yeah. this? So today you have to download MetaMask, um, and complete a 50 step 30 page process <laughs> to, <laughs> sounds, to, to onboard to sounds our easy. <laughs> Um, no, we wanted to make it super easy for people. Uh, so what we did was we created an app called Click. And Click is the first camera app that uses C2PA that's really easy to use. Uh, so it's on iOS and Android. And it allows people to just basically snap a photo with their, with their camera on iPhone and Android and take a signed image and then upload that automatically to a blockchain. So if third parties are looking at that image, they can know that it was real and was taken on your phone. Um, and so we launched this Click app at the end of uh, last year and are now rolling it out to, to, uh, to our user base. Um, and so this is kind of the first step in letting people take content that they can truly own. Uh, as other cameras start to support this, like the system camera on iOS and Android, uh, we will accommodate that. So it won't really matter where you take the picture. You can automatically um, upload it to a blockchain and share it and interact with it and um, and repost that and prove that you are the creator of that. Hmm. And then how would you go about like verifying, I mean, easily verifying that something is, you know, ver like is real or not, right? Like I understand like, okay, you could go look on like Etherscan and do all this kind of like weird, yeah. like wonky stuff or whatever. But like for an average person um, to see like, Hey, like grandpa, like, why don't you, why don't you go like use this app to go check and see if this picture is actually yeah. uh, like verifiable, right? Like what's how, cool, how would that process work? What's cool is that this is rolling out to most media companies, this idea of a content credential, which you can click on the image. Usually it's a CR logo at the top or, three dots at the bottom of the image and then it just shows you it kind of shows you the history of this this mm -hmm. image it was taken by this author on this camera at this time it was uploaded to the nodal network it was assigned by this user um, maybe it was edited so that anybody with that's looking at an image can actually click on that image and then see the, the cryptographic kind of path uh, and the intention behind all this is that if you see an image and there's no content credentials, uh, there's no signature behind that image, then it should be very suspect. Uh, mm. I think somebody said a cool statistic that 
more images were created in the past year by AI than have ever been created in the history of civilization. <laughs> and that's just yeah, this year. I wouldn't, yeah, right. Wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't doubt that. Wouldn't doubt that. Well, so and, if we look uh, even 10 years into the future, um, you know, are the next generation that's looking back and trying to understand what the heck happened in 2024, they might not be able to because all this fake data and all this real data is getting mixed up and we don't know what's real and what's fake. And so that's why this technology becomes so essential. And we think it will become essential for more than just images and videos, really any type of data. And I, and I think that's it's, it's an interesting point because I feel like we're really hitting up, we're, we're rushing up against the point where, you know, like the human brain just can't like process more information than what's currently being thrown at us, right? Yeah. Uh, we're already at the point where it's just like, it's just oversaturation all the time. And now that we have all this like fake stuff coming at us or, or manipulated stuff or whatever it is, at least right now, okay, like you can, you can look at, okay, I can tell if, if somebody, I can look at an image and be like, okay, uh, yeah, somebody used mid journey to create that. Like, like, you know, okay. It's yeah. like, if you've ever created an image in mid journey, you can tell when somebody's using mid journey to create images, right? It's not like rocket science at this point, but this is just sort of like, you know, phase one of this whole rollout of these types of uh, applications, right? This is just the, well, the training wheels phase, right? So these things crazy. are getting more realistic. Yeah, Sorry, what's crazy is that we went to this um, this Adobe event for the C2PA standard. It was called the Content Authenticity Initiative. And DARPA gave us talk there. DARPA is this kind of this government agency in the US that works on all the crazy stuff. Like they literally invented the internet back in the the sixties. And now they work on, if you just check their blog, it's just fascinating to see all of the insane stuff that they're, they're actively funding and, and working on. And one of the uh, researchers came up and said, Hey, we are spending a lot of money building AI that can detect if an image is AI generated. And the result is sometimes it works really, really well. We can detect if, if this image or video is, is fake and he says, but sometimes it doesn't work really well. <laughs> and so basically after spending, you know, a huge, huge research budgets um, to detect fake media, the, the result is you can't. Uh, and, and a lot of the, the reason behind this is that we're adversarially training AI models, which means that you kind of build two AI models, one that generates fake data and then one that is trained to detect that fake data. So inherently to detect the fake data, you have to generate all this fake data and get really good at generating fake data. Uh, so you end up with these AI models that are just really good at generating fake data. Uh, and you can't tell. Humans just- Yeah, all right. Like, well, if, if, yeah, it's like if, if, you, if the AI model, if, he's, if the AI can't even detect AI generated content, then like how is a human yeah. brain going to be able to de detect that, right? And, and it's kind of yeah. similar to like, it's, it, you know, you end up- I, I could see this ending up in the same type of whack-a-mole game that we play with like, you know, just hackers, right? Like we hire white exactly hackers that. to try to hack into our systems and we try to build, you know, we try to get it like 99.9% .9 safe, but there's always going to be a 0.1% vulnerability or some sort yeah. of attack surface that we missed or, you know, some sort of yeah. something that somebody's going to outsmart us and like break into this eventually. And right? you're like, wow, uh, you know, NIST standards aren't that secure. <laughs> or something. <laughs> right? yeah. There's always some, something that's, that's going to happen. Yeah, but that's, I mean, that's crazy. So like they, they can't even, I mean, they're trying to, I mean, what you just said there is mind blowing. Like they're, they're trying to build AI to detect AI generated images and they can't yeah. even, like they're still having problems with that. And this is DARPA. These like, these guys don't mess around, right? Like this isn't just yeah. some like, like, you know, like, sci yeah. you know, co college science experiment or something. This it's is not like a few the, kids playing. Is, it's, you know, government super yeah. computer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's pretty mind blowing. That's, that's really mind blowing. So that's, um, Anyway, so yeah, obviously, I think like the you know what you guys are building here is really important, and it and it and I think it is really important that it comes that somebody has to do this in like a decentralized, like open, like trustless yeah. or like like and decentralized trust sort of manner, right? Because a, if, key, if, a key part of this is really getting um, these transaction costs super low, so that you can basically afford to roll this out for enterprise customers. Um, it has to be you know sub. It, we have to be talking in the pennies per per transaction um, or less to make this something that's actually affordable for people to roll out um, in, an, in an enterprise scale. Um, 
And so that's why we think this really warrants its own L2, um, leveraging the best technology that we can get uh, to just imagine, envision what does a digital trust network for media documents and data uh, look like. And that's what we we announced at ETH Denver was a testnet. Um, things obviously uh, can change and will change, but a testnet uh, to allow anyone to take certified images and, and videos um, and then push that to an L2 on Ethereum. Got it, got it. So this is separate from, or, or how, how is this connected to the parachain then that you guys are building on, on Polkadot then? Is this, today, this like, is a, today, or is this, this totally is a separate, different? It's, this today, is a totally separate, separate thing. Testnet. Just oh, okay, focused okay. on uh, content and data authentication. Uh, got it, got it. We are doing this right now on the parachain. So we're actually running two kind of parallel systems. And we want to see which one kind of performs the best. Uh, at the end of this year, Polkadot's moving to core time. So they're actually killing the concept of a parachain. Um, oh. And it's unclear oh, to the, the, the parachain projects, you know, what does this mean for fee structures? What does this mean for, for all the projects? And so we really want to be at the cutting edge and we want to be where our community is asking us and where our enterprise customers are asking us to be. And that's resolving onto Ethereum mainnet. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty exciting project for us. Um, we think there, there can be a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting things done with this, uh, this layer too, but we want to be just super focused. How do we implement a C2PA using replacing the classical, 1990s architecture of certificate authorities and replace that with a decentralized root of trust. Got it. Got it. Well, it makes sense. I mean, even with the, with the upcoming Den Kuhn upgrade, right. Which the, the, you know, if, if your focus is on really like getting the transaction costs so low that, uh, where it's, it's, you know, pennies or fractions of a penny. To, and yeah. obviously with, with this, with this Den Kuhn upgrade, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the main purpose of it is to really help, you know, reduce, uh, transaction costs on 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 L twos yeah. at least from from my understanding of it. I'm not really an expert, but it, uh, but it, we, so it definitely it, makes. It, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, I said we looked at this just even a few months ago before the holidays. So we said, hey, can we push this stuff as a roll up? And the technology didn't exist. Mm. Like we just didn't have a good way to deploy this in a in a way that uh, the the fees are uh, are affordable and. Um, at the beginning of this year, uh, ZK Sync open sourced their um, uh, some of their code and opened it up for projects to build on. Um, and even today, this is experimental. I mean, this is cutting edge stuff. Uh, if if you read into the documents, uh, they say, "Hey, we recommend a uh, a server that you should run to have at least a terabyte of RAM." And I, I haven't heard of many servers having a terabyte of RAM. So it's like, <laughs> these are some of the most powerful computers that you can get access to as a developer um, uh, just running to, to make your system work. And um, so we're, we're building out our test and in that, which we believe has the best kind of trade-offs um, between um, trustless systems and scalability. And we think even though it takes a ton of computing power today to compute these zero-knowledge proofs, uh, we believe that that's that's the future. That's where things are heading, and that's where eventually we'll see hardware start to be optimized. Um, th there's a lot of problems you can just solve with Moore's law. At least that's right. the idea. <laughs> no, that's super interesting. Super interesting. Um, and then maybe talk a bit about how you guys are using IPFS uh, in in the stack here. What 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 role does that play uh, with, with the content addressing and all that kind of uh, so, and, like. Today, when you when you take an image, take a picture with your phone, um, it's signed using the C2PA standard. Um, we push the the hash of that image, um, essentially its IPFS address, uh, as a transaction onto our blockchain. Uh, the actual content of that file is then pushed to IPFS, so it can become publicly available to people. The Many enterprise customers actually push it to a private interface, a private um, server, uh, because that image is maybe it's of a, of a parking ticket or of a of a something that's something that's sensitive, um, and uh, so that's um, that's something that we focus on for enterprise customers. But for a bulk majority of people, they want it to be accessible for all their friends, uh, or maybe eventually they want to sell the image uh, as an NFT. And so we use IPFS as just 
the where the main content is stored for that file. Something really cool that we're seeing with enterprise is that a lot of people actually want this content um, accessible to third parties so that it can be verified. Hmm. Uh, and so there's a lot of things where, like, um, say if you're pushing uh, climate or energy usage data, you might want this to be publicly auditable so that third parties can check and see if this is correct. And if you're uh, taking carbon credits accurately or, or filing your taxes properly. And so there's a lot of use cases where this concept of, of public data availability is really, really valuable. Um, but ultimately we let the, the enterprise customer or the consumer pick if they want it to host it privately or host it on IPFS. Um, and with that, we're super interested to, to um, potentially test Filecoin. Um, I think, uh, you know, you, you guys are, are one of the oldest and kind of biggest supporters of IPFS. So uh, we've, we've always been a fan over, over the past, um, past, I guess, almost decade that IPFS has been, uh, been being developed. That's very cool. And then and maybe talk a bit about like, what would be, I mean, is there an alternative to IPF? If you, if you do want to make this data publicly available, uh, say I'm an enterprise, I do want to make this data publicly available. Like, is there an alternative to IPFS at this point? Or is, is IPFS really I, like the only thing you could use like pragmatically that would actually make this I, work? I mean, there's competitors, but I, it, you, what you have to look at is say, is this going to be around in 20 years? Mm. And, you know, throwing it on an AWS bucket, That'll probably be around in 20 years. Uh, (laughs) IPFS, I think, will definitely be around in 20 years. Um, A lot of these other projects, it's not so it's not so clear. And when you're doing actual enterprise integrations, you have to you have to make that decision. And and a lot of times, the enterprise customer is looking at you and they're saying, "Are you going to be around in 20 years, or even in two years?" (laughs) And um, and so you have to make sure that everything that you're building on is super robust. Um, that it's easy for for enterprise customers to kind of get their hands into if they need to, um, and so we want to pick the best, most robust uh, technologies that we believe will set us up really well for the future. Got it, got it. And then, I mean, be kind of looking ahead. You know, uh, you just made this announcement. Uh, you're just kind of rolling this out. Um, maybe talk a bit about who you see as what's kind of like your go-to-market strategy here. Who are you going to be your early adopters of this or who, maybe who are folks yep. who are already using it, but who, who's, who's kind of next on the list of customers you're targeting or cool. trying to get this in front of. So on the enterprise side of things, we have a few people that are integrating. I can't talk about that yet. Um, but think um, images, videos, documents, um, we're seeing a lot of interest around the idea of publishing press releases and quarterly financial statements. So there's fake press releases going on all the time, and this is a big issue for public companies. People will say a fake uh, press release, the stock price gets impacted, it, it becomes a real issue. And so having a way to publish authentic documents becomes really, really interesting. Hmm. On the consumer side of things, um, we're really interested in this idea of giving anybody with a smartphone the power to kind of click your truth. We, we like to say um, anyone with a phone can take a picture and it doesn't matter if it's somebody nobody's ever heard of in, in, um, in a small country, that picture can have the power to change the world, especially if it's verifiable as real. Um, and in a world where everything's going to be questioned, um, that ability to, to prove what's real and what's fake is, becomes really important and, and empowers regular people to potentially change the world, which we think is really exciting um, and really, really good for democracy and, and freedom as a whole. So we're worth spending a lot of time building out the, the Click app. And if you start to dig into just what's possible on a modern smartphone, it's really incredible. Um, I know an iPhone, you know, a modern iPhone isn't accessible to a lot of people in the world, but the, a modern iPhone has more computing power and more, uh, more image and data capture capabilities than a cinema camera did just a few years ago. Um, even today it has more compute power than most modern cinema cameras. So you're starting to see a device that's in the hands of millions of people that 
it can capture images that are better than how documentaries and 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 movies were shot just a few years ago. Um, and a lot of those features of that that smartphone haven't been opened up. You know, in the you know you can only access them with APIs or with uh, mm. with um, if you're really a developer and know what to look for. So we think that kind of activating that and and in letting the smartphone live up to its full potential, activating features that um, aren't really used today. That's something that we've always loved doing and always kind of gotten in trouble for um, on the wireless side. And on this side, we can do that with the camera and we can use our network that we've created to verify uh, what's being created in the real world. So, uh, so does this, this, uh, app allow for video authentication as well, or is it strictly just images right now? Images, videos, um, and documents coming soon. And documents. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Um, it's really interesting. I mean, kind of stepping back maybe from the technology side momentarily here, um, you know, it just, this whole conversation has kind of reminded me of something my, my grandpa used to always say, (laughs) sorry, my dad is calling me on WhatsApp here. I should probably close my WhatsApp. So Joe, I suppose you'll want to edit that part out, but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, but yeah, so going back to like my, my grandpa used to always say, you know, I always kind of dismissed it as some sort of like, you know, boomer, or like sort of curmudgeon thing that you know, <laughs> it's like, he's always say like, you know, believe, you know, nothing that you hear in half of what you see. Right. And, yeah. uh, and it's like, okay, whatever, you know, just people say stuff, whatever. <laughs> But then, you know, now, but the last couple of years, you know, you, you get to the point where, okay, you, just because you see something on Twitter, like an image on Twitter, okay, like you shouldn't necessarily accept that at just face value because somebody tweeted yeah. it. We've had things like community notes and whatever the predecessor was, a tw- community notes, like fact checking things or whatever. But even that stuff, you can't like, you know, 100% trust that that's accurate either. Um, and all yeah. of a sudden now it's like, okay, you have, there's like fake videos too. Like, you know, this, this video could be taken really out of context. Um and even not even just not, not even talking about like AI generated videos, just like videos that are taken out of context. Like, you know, somebody takes something seeing, from 10 uh, years ago. We're seeing fake cyber attacks now where people are calling up or fake phishing attacks where executives are being called up with a deep fake of another executive to transfer money. And there's being huge attacks being play, played out just this way. So it's scary. Like if you get a call, you don't know if that's your wife or your business partner uh, you yeah. know, the other end of the line. Yeah. And that's, so it's, it's getting to the point where, um, it, I, I feel like for, for the solution that you guys are, I mean, I feel like, you know, if what you guys are building works, it seems like, okay, this is a solution that could, you know, that will really address some of these issues. Um, I feel like, you know, aside from the technology, the big hurdle is going to be, I don't almost just like, it's almost like a human behavioral like pattern that people have to be kind of trained into where yeah. it's like, look, like, anything you see that, that like you're, if you're going to take some sort of action based on what you see or hear or whatever, like you need to first verify that this is real, right? You need to go and check. You need to click on the little, on the link and see if there's like a verifiable. And if something is not, doesn't have this kind of verification to it, you need to be like immediately suspect of that. Like we, people need to, you know, you almost need to like engineer people's behavior to get to that point where they're just instinctively looking for that. Right. Um, almost right now where it's like, okay, if I see an image and it's like, okay, that's obviously like a mid journey thing that was produced. Like, okay, I'm not going to pay any attention to that. Right. Or I'm not going to give that any credibility. Um, but, but you, um, you won't be able to tell. I mean, even mid journey, yeah, you can make pretty convincing mid journey stuff today if you know what to do. And in a year it's like, we won't be able to tell this. What's yeah. Real. Like that's just, that's a temporary. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, like that's right now you can take modernity yeah. that will not exist. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly so there's no way you're gonna be able to tell right so you can't rely on your own instincts or or your own kind of uh you know gut feelings or whatever you really yeah. just have to get into the habit of like okay i need to just you know if i'm going to take any you know sensitive action based on this media i need to just check that and see if it's real first right yeah um so that's i feel like that's going to be an interesting hurdle is just getting people to be i guess aware that this is a problem which they'll figure out eventually but then also like yeah. hey like it's it's like it's like you stop and look both ways before you cross the street type of thing right yeah. <laughs> like like don't I run across the street until you look we're entering a really interesting time where it's like just the psychological impact of all this on civilization is going to be crazy like yeah i spent a lot of time working in um the facebook uh vr where you'd have your desktop in front of you 
and you'd be in some like mountain dojo and it was really cool. And I found that I would start questioning reality when I was out of VR. Mm. Um, and with the new Apple uh, VR system, the resolution is so good that it's so quick to be tricked into thinking that you're just, you're on top of a mountain with a, you know, a 4k desktop in front of you or an mm. IMAX screen in front of you. That's your computer. And uh, the psychological impact of that is going to be insane. Um, and as we start to move into a world of um, post-quantum key cryptography, where you know today what we're, we're hoping is that this cryptography will kind of save us from this. Um, and uh, in the future, you know, who, who knows? Uh, so there's I think no guarantees, it's, right? There's no, yeah, there's no, no guarantees. It's not a you know, cryptography is not a. It's it's. It's it's not a it's not set in stone. It just says that it's really hard for a computer to decrypt or to break, um, and uh, and a lot of these things aren't even like, proven out that well. They're just with our current understanding of computers. So we're going to see a lot of things change in our lifetime, probably in the next decade, um, and it's going to have just fascinating impacts on civilization. Um, you know, maybe it'll just make us all religious. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's, when you think about just like how easily, you know, manipulate, I mean, the human brain is, is like, it's just an amazing organ, right? It, that was yeah. like, it's so powerful. It's so on so many levels, but it, it is at the same time, like humans are very, uh, our emotions are so easy to manipulate and our senses yeah. are so easy to manipulate. Um, I mean, I remember the first time I put on like it, like an Oculus Quest like headset, the, one of the Facebook headsets, and there's this game where you you go up an elevator and you go out on like a like you're at the top of a skyscraper, and then yeah. you like you basically like jump off the plank and you, you your your body like thinks you're falling and you're like freaking. Oh, yeah. out. I remember I've heard <laughs> and, of this. Yeah, and it's like you've been like you're you're it's like you know you're not falling, but your 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 brain like thinks you're actually falling and you're kind of like tricked into it, right? So, but it's like our senses are so easily uh, manipulatable. <laughs> If you know, if you know how to do it, right. If you know the right buttons to push, even with like music, right. Like you can, you can, if you're yeah. a skilled musician, like you can, you can basically induce or like, you know, put the, put your audience or your listener into a certain emotional state just based on the music you're playing. Yeah. Um, if you know what you're doing. Right. So, I mean, yeah. with this stuff, what you're talking about, like, this is just like on steroids, right. Cause you, you know, these, these computers are going to be way more, these algorithms are way more Incredible. intelligent. And then, then what we can, what we can handle. So, um, anyway, this has been super interesting, Garrett, really appreciate your time. Uh, yeah. appreciate the opportunity to kind of like walk out on these subjects here. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you the and floor just, if you have any other like final thoughts. You want yeah, to share. I was just going to finish. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of thinking about what, what the future looks like and, and studying history and I've kind of mapped two real threats for AI in the next, the next decade. One is, um, it's, it's probably going to replace a lot of jobs. I think the wealth, the, the, the wealth creation that AI will have in the next decade is going to make the industrial revolution look like nothing. Mm. I mean, wow. we're, we're only a few years into this kind of AI, uh, bubble and you've already got guys going out trying to raise trillions of dollars for <laughs> chip plants from the South, right. <laughs> which is insane. Um, and, uh, and so I think that AI will generate so much wealth, so much, uh, so much money, and it'll be so there was so much um, wealth gap that this will break civilization. I think this will cause a big a big issue for us, um, and it'll make the industrial revolution look like uh, something that's just just like nothing. Wow. Um, and uh, and then the second is this idea of sentiment analysis. Uh, so again, if you look at where DARPA is funneling money into, uh, there's a lot of work going out to map how ideas spread throughout civilization. And a lot of this is actually joint research with Facebook. Um, there's been a bunch of documents leaked about uh, programs from the last election cycle. Um, and so in my opinion, some of the most dangerous AI that's being applied today is actually to map an idea spreading through civilization and to understand which people might be susceptible to this idea. Um, today it's used to sell you shoes or whatever you're seeing ads for on Instagram these days. Uh, uh, but it could be used for all, all kinds of other things. And we want to make sure that, uh, we're on the right side of history when all this, as all this plays out. 
And in my opinion, content attestation and using a decentralized root of trust that plugs into Ethereum um, is, is one of the best ways that we can make sure that this future ends up properly, that as all this is playing out, we can know what's real, we can know what's fake, and that us humans can figure out uh, the best path forward. Dude, this is nuts, man, what you're describing right now. But it's but at the same time, it's like, it's not on, like it's nuts in the sense that like, it's totally feasible. Like I can totally see yeah. everything you're describing happening yeah. <laughs> like in, 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 very, in a very short time, right? That's the, like, yeah, like, this wait is a stuff what? that exists today. Like this is, you know, yeah. what's happening. Um, but you have to be an optimist. The, the greatest scientific discoveries in the next decade will also be aided with artificial intelligence. You know, this is the technology that, will take us to other planets. It will solve some of the hardest medical problems. I have a friend building a large genomic model who works in my office and he's, he's training it on for drug discovery and it works like, and this is like huh. one guy working for a year, you know, kind of wow. like in his lab, but over his laptop and, and people are building AI models that can understand how the genome works. So I think you have to be optimistic. It's easy to be kind of like, Oh, this is going to be horrible. <laughs> it's, it's easy to uh, kind of get down about this stuff but just you know be, we have to be an optimist humans h- humans uh, always always get through yeah 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 and, and, and there's there is always this this sentiment of of you know just playing kind of this doomsday card and 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 i think the the ai you know taking over the world and like taking over human outsmarting humans and becoming the new overlords is kind of this uh you know it's sort of the fud of of this industry maybe you know i guess you know crypto yeah. has its fud this is kind of the ai fud and a lot of it's being maybe used by folks who don't understand the technology or they're trying to figure out how yeah. they can like regulate well, it without this- actually understanding what it is so what's happening is that all the big ai companies are f- funding this this FUD, um, and they're uh, using it to regulate okay. all the small guys out of business. If, uh, if you okay. look at this uh, okay. article this morning, I saw about <laughs> um, uh, how all the big AI companies are, are funding lobbyists to regulate the stuff so that small players don't have a way to really enter the market. Um, hmm. So I, I think a lot of it is is that really. It's I, I think people are being too negative. I think you know Pandora's box has been opened. Uh, you yeah. can't shut it. Uh, AI, AI is out there. I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be really positive for civilization. And that when you worry about the threats, you have to map it to to what is currently understood and can be done. You know, LLMs aren't going to just rise up and start, you know, machine gunning people. Um, so we have to actually map what what's possible to to the current capabilities and in the risks of those current capabilities. And again, I argued with a lot of AI researchers and philosophers who who, who com- completely disagree. Um, but I think we just have to be rational about it and say, look at what's possible, understand the threat model there, um, and try to implement things like attestation that can help us mitigate some of these threats. Wow. Well, that's probably a good place to end the conversation here, but, um, this has really been really incredible. I've learned a lot here and, you know, I really appreciate the work you're doing. This is, this is pretty inspiring, especially within that, given kind of the broader context you just described in the last few minutes here. Um, you know, the work that you're doing with, with this attestation product and it just seems, you know, like we need something like this, like somebody needs to build this. So, so, so thank you for taking the initiative on this and, um, really, really enjoy just picking your brain and hearing your insights on this. Cause you seem, uh, as immersed as anybody in this, and you've obviously thought long and hard about these problems. And it seems like you're really trying to tackle this, um, you know, from an ethical kind of humanity first, uh, perspective here and not just you know, my, my company first, like let's, let's crowd everybody out of the out so we can capture all the, all the value first, uh, type of approach here. So, um, Garrett really appreciate your time. Um, and, uh, best of luck with, uh, with the launch and, and getting this product, uh, up and running and out to market, Thank um, you. you know, over the coming year, really, uh, really appreciate it. We'll be definitely be following this. Thanks. It's always a pleasure.